Uh, shalom, my sisters and brothers. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I trust that you have had a very fruitful day. I know it has been eventful. Uh, I was thinking about all the challenges we have had in the last few days, less than 10 days ago. It was registered five degrees here where we live and today it registered 85 degrees. <laughs> um, they say that if you live in Texas and you don't like the weather, stick around for a few minutes and you'll get what you like. But we thank God uh, who is not only He's not the weather reporter, but he is the weather man, and so he controls all things, and I praise him for that. Uh, I know that you're praying for our congregation, all of what we consider the losses, uh, those who have transitioned, gone home to be with the Lord, praying for each family, praying for our bereaved families that you would just keep them in your prayers. We are looking tonight uh, in Jude verse number 20. Jude verse number 20. Let me read King James Version. Uh, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's the King James Version. We have reference scriptures um, Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12, 1 Peter 2, 2, uh, Romans 8, 26 through 27, and Ephesians 6, 8. Uh, thank God for those who sent in uh, written responses tonight, sisters uh, Ruthie Carter, uh, Vera Burton, Shawana Abrams, Cheryl Carpenter, uh, thank God for Brother Harvey Williams, Ministers Gary Burton and Adrian Abrams. And thank God for those of you who follow uh, the Bible study uh, and do not send in written, written responses that they are not required. They are just discussion points uh, as we deal with God's word. And... Uh, to Brother Harvey Williams, I just looked on my computer and saw where I missed your responses the last time. Please forgive me. I overlooked those. Uh, counted to my head and not my heart. Let's delve into these. Uh, number one, define the terminology, your most holy faith. Elaborate. I am reading your most holy faith is defining the best way to stay strong in the struggle against apostates. The best way is to advance and build our faith. The teachings that have been given to us believers is to emphasize the importance of letting God's word guide our faith. The defense against false teachings start with growing in the knowledge and application of scripture, just like the development of a baby. Uh, God gave his word to make us wise and spiritually mature. We have prayer that is inspired and empowered by the Holy Spirit that goes hand in hand with God's word. Uh, background scripture, 1 Peter 2, 2. The terminology that Jude uses, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, was an exhortation to the church to grow in their faith. For among them, Jude knew there were these false teachers, those spots in their feast, these apostates, those who had crept in unawares, and growing in faith would be and is as important to their spiritual being as water would be to their physical being. Every believer has been given a measure of faith, but after salvation, we each are encouraged to grow therein. Here, he makes it perfectly clear that it is very, every believer's 
obligation to build up yourselves and to work on yourselves. Continual growth in faith is a personal responsibility. Ephesians 2.20 assures us that we are not starting from scratch, that the foundation has already been laid by the prophets, the apostles, and by Jesus Christ himself, who is the cornerstone of our faith, but we are to build upon it. Yes, build upon that something that already exists and that foundation that has already been laid and established. The words build and building have always implied the need of the use of materials. Here, the needed materials that are to be used for this particular building project are praying in the Spirit and also that which is stated in Ephesians 6.18, the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Another response says, uh, we are encouraged to build ourselves up through the committed study of the word of God and obedience to Christ's commands to his church as laid out in the Bible. We are to study to show ourselves approved unto God and to rightly divide the God-breathed word of truth, which is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The building up in the faith is not selfish and self-absorbing. Rather, this building is a collective matter. We are to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. Jude is speaking to the believers collectively when he charges them to build up themselves in their most holy faith. To build ourselves in the most holy faith is to build up the body of Christ. Another response says, as Christians, as a child of God, we are in line for the inheritance of salvation. We should not be satisfied in our Christian growth. Acts 2032 says God's grace is able to build up or make strong those who are sanctified, set apart. We should be constantly growing in his word, his way, and towards his will, not in our own strength, but by his grace, that is unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. Ephesians 4 says it is a gift to fully equip and perfect the saints for service. To build up yourselves on your most holy faith is to grow spiritually by continually learning what God says and act on it. Another response is, to build yourself on your most holy faith is to exercise yourself unto godliness, praying in the spirit, keeping yourself in the love of God, to train your mind, conscience, and spirit. Having faith helps you to see the unseen, but building up yourself enables you to go far and possess what you see. Faith is the master key that gives us access to the abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Another response is, in previous verses, verses 17 through 19, Jude exhorts us to recall, to remember the teachings of Christ and the word of God. Now, in verses 20 through 23, Jude issues a call to action, a call to action that is guided by your most holy faith. This kind of faith is realized by a strengthened knowledge of the word of God and his teachings. That strengthening is accomplished by submission to the study, the hearing, and the will of God's word. That's 1 Peter 2.2. 2. 2 Timothy 2.15, Ephesians 4.11-12, through 12, Acts 20.32, and Proverbs 3.6. A final response on first question is, Christian believers had a solid foundation and true cornerstone in Christ Jesus upon which they can use to build themselves up this holy faith. This truth points the believer to the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, and the command and the testimonies of the word of God to build themselves upon Ephesians 2.20. This phrase also paints a portrait of true dependence upon God and the grace of God for one's continual growth. It is to exercise yourself unto godliness.
All right, let's look at the second question. What does it mean to pray in the Holy Ghost or in the Spirit? Why is this so important? The Greek word translated pray in can have several different meanings, such as by means of, with the help of, in the sphere of, and in connection to. Praying in the Spirit has reference to what is being said or does not have reference to what is being said, but refers to how the person is praying. This phrase means to be led by the Spirit in prayer, praying for things that are revealed by the Spirit when we do not know what to pray for. As Romans 8, 26-27 encourages us to allow the Spirit to help in our weakness and have Him intercede for us because we do not know what to pray for all the Spirit is to be our helper, allowing and rely on the Holy Spirit to guide our prayers according to God's will and purpose, to rely on the gifts and power of the Spirit to bring effectively and with faith. When we submit our hearts and minds to the direction and leading of the Holy Spirit and then pray in His power, we are praying in the Spirit. A second response is, to pray in the Holy Ghost, the Spirit means being in harmony with God's will in our prayer. By being aligned with His will, the Holy Spirit, according to Romans 8, 26 and 27, prays for us, even when we do not know what we should pray or know how to pray. Additional references Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Another reference, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That is Proverbs 3 and 6, King James Version. Still reading. To pray in the Holy Ghost of Spirit is to pray with divine help. It's trusting in faith and relying on God to hear, understand, and act. Praying in the Spirit is a gift to be received through faith in Christ Jesus, except in Paul's word. We do not know what we are to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. That's Romans 8, 26. It is important to pray in the Spirit because He makes our prayers effective. He makes the Scriptures come alive and speak to our hearts. Jude 1.20 says, But you, beloved, building up yourself in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Another response says, The Bible tells us men ought always pray. Luke 18.1 Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, but the Bible also says the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses because we do not know what to pray for as we should. To pray in the Holy Ghost is to pray with a spiritual mindset. As I am constantly growing in God's word and ways, let the Holy Spirit lead me in prayer. The spiritual mindset is to be in concert with God's desires. His will for our circumstances, situations, and all saints. Another response is, we are commanded to pray in the Holy Ghost, the Spirit, which means we are to lay aside our fleshly nature and be led and guided by the Lord in accordance with the will of God. It means to pray on the things the Spirit brings to mind as we focus on thoughts on God and man. Romans 8.26 says that the Holy Spirit helps us when we don't know what to pray or when we can't find the words to express our heart. He in turn utters groans that we do not understand. He is so closely connected to God that he knows what pleases him and how to best convey our prayers to him. It is important to invite the Holy Spirit to help us understand because we are limited in our understanding of the things of God. 
It is also important for us to pray in the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit and not pray in accordance with our own selfish desires or by making foolish and prideful declarations which are dishonoring the Lord. Another response is, it is important to pray in the Holy Ghost or Spirit using the sword of the Spirit, God's Word, in fighting evil forces while praying in the Spirit. We are to lay aside our fleshly nature and to be led and guided by the Lord in accordance with God's will. This sets a firm foundation in which we pray in His strength and wisdom. We are to encourage one another and seek to build each other up in our faith by praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. He then moves our hearts and directs our request. Romans 8, 26 and 27. And the final response is the meaning of the phrase praying in the Spirit. Uh, some have argued that this refers to the gift of praying in or speaking in tongue. As much as I am a believer in the word, that there are those that truly possess the gift of tongues. However, praying in the Spirit here has absolutely nothing to do with this gift. For one reason, we know that not all believers are expected to have the gift of tongues according to 1 Corinthians 12, 30. So since this is not a gift expected of every believer, then how could this be possible? Yet, in Jude one twenty, this praying in the Spirit, Jude is expected to be done of all believers when speaking in tongues is not. This phrase in its proper context is acknowledgement and recognition of inability. All believers pray in the Spirit without the power of the Spirit. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, For we know not how to pray as we ought, as we should, so the Spirit himself make it intercessions for us. This is so important for the saint, for without him, the Holy Spirit, we are not able to pray effectively, to put into words what it is that we really need from God and is needed of God. Only we are not capable, alone we are not capable of properly inquiring or knowing what we should pray for. He then comes alongside us to help our weaknesses and make intercession for the saints according to the will of God with groaning that cannot be heard. To further more proof this point, even these hand-picked disciples of Jesus Christ, those who walked closer with him when he was here on earth, felt the great need to ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. So it is to hear that Jesus taught his disciples to pray as it is known in Scripture as the Lord's Prayer. I thank God for those who responded uh, in writing uh, to those questions. Uh, the question gives us uh, a third opportunity to interact uh, with the Word of God. We read it. We study it. Uh, we write down what we believe, and then we interact uh, by receiving um, further instruction or further elaboration. So may God uh, continue to bless you. Uh, let me read what I have. Uh, define the terminology, your most holy faith. The false teachers were in the business of tearing down. But each believer must be in the business of building up our own spiritual life and then the spiritual lives of our sisters and brothers in the family of God. This building up is, of course, a large part of the process of sanctification after having been set apart through the Spirit of the Lord and continuing to be set apart more and more throughout the Christian life. Our most holy faith is a reference to Jude, verse 3, where Jude says that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. 
Most holy faith refers to the entire body of beliefs taught by the apostles and held by Christians. It was and is most holy because it came from the most holy God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. We must become doctrinally strong if we are to recognize error or false teaching and victoriously fight the battle for truth. This building up is an imperative, and so that means it is a command, and we do not have an option, not in still please the Lord. It implies personal edification, building up, personal edification, and spiritual growth. The establishing of the firm foundation upon sound doctrine. So it centers on receiving the word of God through study and application according to Acts 20 and 32. God gifted the church with all it takes to build up the body of Christ. That's in Ephesians 11, uh, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. It is the word that the most holy faith which we should crave for spiritual nourishment and spiritual growth. While godless men and women enter the Christian community to bring division and damage, we are commanded to build each other up and strengthen the unity of the church. This faith, this body of truth, is a gift from the Lord that is entrusted to the Christians, the church, and is described in the superlative form, most holy. It originates with God and therefore is perfect, pure, and incomparable. Question number two. What does it mean to pray in the Holy Ghost, uh, in the Holy Spirit? Why is this important? Uh, first of all, I, I, I emphasize Holy Spirit because wherever uh, we find Holy Ghost in the King James Version, it is translated from the Greek Holy Spirit, Hagios Penume. Hagios means holy, Penume means spirit. So Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. The only time uh, that ghost is used uh, legitimately is when uh, the disciples are on the boat and they see something coming toward them. And King James says, and they thought it was a spirit. Well, that's the word ghost. But other than that, Whenever you see the term Holy Ghost, the King James, it is Holy Spirit in the original Greek language. So Holy Spirit. Why is this so important? In, of course, is a preposition. And we talk about praying in the Holy Spirit. It can therefore be substituted with other proper and appropriate prepositions, which do not destroy the truth of the text. By this I mean that praying in the Spirit, as someone said early, equally means to pray with the Holy Spirit, that is, with His help and aid. So in can be substituted for with. Praying in the Holy Spirit means to pray by the Holy Spirit, that is, by way of His direction and inspiration and illumination. So, in can be properly substituted with by and not destroy the context or the truth of the text. Praying in the Holy Spirit means to pray through the Holy Spirit. You can interchange those, you can exchange those words without doing damage to the text. That is, through His power and through His provisions, through Him as the Creator's chosen channel of communication. So when we pray, pray in the Spirit, we're praying through 
or in the spirit as a channel of communication. He alone, the Holy Spirit, is the channel of communication with God himself. Why? Because he is God. God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God the Holy Spirit is God. The Trinity, that's where we get our word Trinity, triunity, three in one. Three persons, one God, right? So praying in the Spirit means to pray according to the leading of the Spirit, as someone said earlier. This is not talking about the gift of tongues. It means according to the leading of the Spirit. Prayer is not getting our will done but it's getting God's will done on earth. What we pray is not to try to get our will done in heaven. Now, name it and claim it. No. Your word say it. And so, no. Praying in the spirit means praying according to the leading of the spirit. And prayer is not about getting our will done in heaven. To get God to do something. Prayer is about getting God's will done on earth. Should we make petitions to God? Yes. But the main purpose of prayer is not to get God to do something. It's that God can do something through us, to us, for us, with us. And so prayer is not getting our will done in heaven, but it is getting God's will done on earth. And that all begins with praying in the spirit. This means then praying under the inspirational and inspiring influence of the spirit of God or of God, the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God and God, the Holy Spirit, same terminology. God actually helps his children to properly pray to himself. That's the awesome miracle uh, in prayer. Just like God gives us the faith to exercise faith. Here, God helps us to talk to him. And I know that's awesome. And so why is this so important? It is so important because any other praying does not reach the holy and wholesome standard for prayer, which God himself has set. Prayer is the lifeline that connects all Christians to our Savior and Lord. When we pray in the Spirit, as someone said earlier, we therefore submit ourselves to Him. We rest on His wisdom. We seek His will. And we trust his power. Those verses, John uh, chapter 14, verses 14 through 17, 1 John 5, 14 through 15, Romans 8, 26, 27, Ephesians 6, 18, are just proofs that, that we are praying in the Spirit when we are submitting to God's will for our lives, when we rest in what God knows in his wisdom when we seek his will because we know that God's will is the best every time and that we trust his power. And so the Holy Spirit uh, helps us to get in a place in prayer where 
we want nothing but God's will, God's way, God's wisdom, and nothing else. And, and so when we pray uh, the model prayer, as was said earlier, uh, some call it the Lord's Prayer, but the Lord's Prayer is actually in John 17. But when we pray the model prayer, it's a pattern for prayer. And it's a pattern of prayer. It's a paradigm. It's a way to cover a lot of material, a lot of things in one prayer. And part of that prayer is, Thy will be done on earth because we know that God's will is the best for everybody involved. May God continue to uh, bless and keep you, trust that you are helped uh, and that you're being helped through this uh, walk through uh, Jude. Uh, continue to pray for me as preacher and pastor. I will continue to pray for you and your family and uh, draw closer to God and draw closer to each other. Shalom.